right. Uh, it's a great honor to be here. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for the uh, for the invitation. Um, I, as you as you saw, like I snuck up the uh, the abstract uh, for you. Um, I hope you had a chance to like briefly look at this. Uh, this talk is going to be based on an article uh, that just appeared online in uh, Physics Today that I wrote together with uh, Jurgen Wren, who also is like responsible for the content of this talk. That article, in turn, is uh, is trying to bring to a broader audience like a big book that uh, a team uh, it, at the Max Planck Institute uh, put together, came out in, in 2007, there's four volumes, in particular like uh, bits in volume one and two on Einstein's famous uh, Zurich notebook. Now here's the, uh, I can't resist showing you the Amazon page for the book, and you're in luck in, uh, on two counts. <laughs> you can be the first to review it, <laughs> and you can own a new copy for less than $1,000. <laughs> So um, then there is also like a, a chapter that deals more with like in what sense like uh, general relativity does and doesn't relativize uh, motion, and that's a chapter in the in the Cambridge Companion to Einstein, and that's a lot cheaper. You can get that for just thirty-seven bucks. Um, all right. So <clears throat> basically, just to give you the quick overview, um, uh, yesterday was actually I think sort of the big day of the breakthrough to the final version of general relativity. So at that, on that day, November 4th, Einstein presented like a communication to the Berlin Academy in which he replaced the field equations known as the Entwurf or outline equations that he'd been working on for two and a half years by equations of much broader covariance. These Entwurf equations are equations of ex severely limited covariance. And so what happened then is that he returned like for three consecutive Thursdays to tweak this, and so uh, on November 11th, he made like a little change to these equations to make them generally covariant. The first version of the theory is still not generally covariant, it's only covariant on the unimodular transformations. So then in, uh, on November 18, like he put the theory to work and was able to explain the perihelion motion of Mercury. And then on November 25th, which is really the birthday of the Einstein field equations, he tweaked the equations of November 4th in a much more convincing way by adding a trace term of the energy momentum tensor on the right-hand side, and that thereby arrived at the field equations. So we then end up with, this is the title page of that, uh, of that last article, we end up with this beautiful arch that we've admired since, right? Here are the Einstein field equations, the way Einstein wrote them. You see this g mu nu on the, on the left-hand side, you see the t here, so you may think like I'm overdoing it. No, 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 the g in Einstein's notation is just the Ricci tensor, right? So here your energy momentum, metric tensor, the trace. And uh, what you see down here is that, uh, that Einstein, and this will become late, uh, important later on, uh, that Einstein still splits the Ricci tensor into two parts, uh, using r for one part and s for another part, and of course defined in terms of the Christoffel symbols, and the Christoffel symbols in turn defined in terms of the metric and its derivatives. Now, the question then with any arch is like, how did he build that? How did he get that beautiful arch? And first I want to show you like what the old sage said about it later on. So this is in his autobiographical notes. Einstein had a very fine sort of self-deprecating sense of humor, so he referred to this as my own obituary. So he says, I have learned something else from the theory of gravitation. No collection of empirical facts, no matter how comprehensive, can ever lead to the formulation of such complicated equations. They can only be found through the discovery of a logically simple mathematical condition that completely or almost completely determines the equations. Once one, ha once one has those sufficiently strong formal conditions, one requires only little knowledge of facts to set up a theory. So this is a very familiar theme in for the later Einstein, the emblematic text in which he sort of uh, expounds on his heavy reliance on mathematics is a lecture he gave, the, Spencer, the Herbert Spencer lecture in Oxford in 1933, and I want to read you a passage from that as well. So Einstein says, Newton still believed that the basic concepts and laws of his system could be derived from experience. A clear, a clear recognition of the erroneousness of this notion really only came with the general theory of relativity, which showed that one could take account of a wider range of empirical facts in a more satisfactory and complete manner on a foundation quite different from the Newtonian. If then, he says, it is true that the axiomatic basis of theoretical physics cannot be extracted from experience, but must be freely invented, can we ever hope to find the right way. So Einstein is very confident about the answer to this. And he goes on in the passage that's most famous from this lecture, he says, I answer without hesitating that there is, in my opinion, a right way. 
Our experience hitherto justifies us in believing that nature is the realization of the simplest conceivable mathematical ideas. I am convinced that we can discover by means of purely mathematical constructions the concepts and the laws which furnish the key to the understanding of natural phenomena. Experience remains, of course, the sole criterion of physical utility of a mathematical construction, but the creative principle resides in mathematics. In a certain sense, therefore, I hold it true that pure thought can grasp reality as the ancients dreamed, like a clear reference to people like Pythagoras and Plato. Now, in history of science, we learn to be very wary of these statements that are made decades after the fact. Okay? And we want to see what did people say when they were actually working on these theories. Now, at first, it seems that what Einstein is saying in 1933 fits very well with what he said in November of 1915. So this is like from the, um, uh, from the first uh, uh, paper of November 15. And for those of you who were at, uh, at, the, the, at Brian Crean's performance last night, like you have heard this, uh, this, 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 this passage, you'll recognize it. So Einstein writes in the in introduction of this important paper, I completely lost confidence in this Entwurf theory and looked for a way that would constrain the possibilities in a natural manner. I was just led back to the demand of a more general covariance, which I had abandoned with a heavy heart three years ago when I was collaborating with my friend, the mathematician Marcel Grossman. In fact, back then, we already came very close to the solution of the problem given below. Then there's like, you know, I left out a few bits. And he concludes saying, hardly anybody who has truly understood the theory will be able to avoid coming under its spell. It's a real triumph of the method of the ge general differential calculus developed by Gauss, Riemann, Cristoffel, Ricci, and Levi Civita. And then, you know, he says that, concludes, after what has been said so far, it is natural to posit field equations of the form r mu nu is equal kappa t mu, where again, remember that r mu nu is just half the Ricci tensor. All right, let's go further back and look at, uh, you know, what he was doing three years earlier with Grossman. And it turns out that, once again, uh, uh, it confirms what Einstein says in 1915. So here is the Zurich Notebook, page 22R for the Cognoscenti. So, um, so you see here at the top, the name Grossman appears, and below it you have the Ricci tensor. Again, you know, here's the Christoffel symbols. And then what Einstein does is like he restricts like the covariance to unimodular transformations, where the, transforma the, the determinant of the transformation matrix is one. Under such transformations, the, 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 uh, uh, the determinant of the metric is going to transform as a scalar. That means that this quantity, that's just the, the gradient of the log of the square root of, the, uh, of, the, of that determinant, is going to be like a vector. And that you can now identify the two terms that are underlined here as uh, essentially like the covariant derivative of that vector. So under unimodular transformation, this thing is going to be a second rank tensor. Since the whole thing is a generally covariant uh, tensor, it has to be the case that this other part is also going to be a tensor under unimodular transformations. That for Einstein is the probable gravitation tensor. And this is exactly the thing that returns on the right, on the left hand side of the field equations like two and a half years later. This is it. Okay, and here's a picture of Grossman. So what went wrong in 1913? So what went wrong is that Einstein couldn't see that these equations that were very natural mathematically made sense from a physical point of view. So he couldn't work out that uh, they reduced to Newtonian theory in the case of weak static fields, uh, as they should, and that they were compatible with energy momentum conservation. So I want to look a little bit more at this problem of the Newtonian limit. And so this is sort of the standard account that you can find like in Pi's The Subtle is the Lord. And the story there is simply that Einstein and Grossman did not know about the modern concept of coordinate conditions. And say, look, you know, like if you're going to compare like generally covariant equations to Newtonian equations, you're going to have to restrict the covariance of the former because, the, you know, after all, the Poisson equation is not generally covariant. And you do that by imposing like four conditions on the metric, which are just gauge conditions, you know. Um, all right. Now, unfortunately, that very same page I showed you also shows that Einstein knows full well what the condition is he needs in order to get those equations down to something like the Poisson equation. So this is further down on that same page, right? And so he writes down the condition that uh, this, uh, uh, so this gamma here is like his way of, uh, with downstairs indices, is his way of writing the countervariant metric, right? Which we now would write as just G with upstairs indices. And uh, so he sets this uh, equal to zero, and then you find that the only term that you have to worry about in first order approximation is a term that looks very much, you know, like the, uh, like the Laplacian acting on the metric. These terms are all quadratic in first derivative, so they can be neglected. All right, so it seems 
uh, that wasn't the problem. But then what was? Now, John Norton, uh, in a groundbreaking paper on this Turing notebook back in 1984, put his finger on what the problem was. And that, and that is that if you now look at the metric of Minkowski spacetime as viewed from a merry-go-round, that metric is not going to satisfy that coordinate condition. Okay? And that was very it was very important to Einstein that that metric like, satisfies the vacuum field equations because that is sort of implementing the equivalence principle for the case of like, you know, a rotating observer. So now the probable gravitation tensor, right, this half the Ricci tensor, that thing vanishes for the rotation metric. But once you eliminate like a bunch of terms, once you truncate it by imposing this condition that the divergence of the covariant metric vanishes, it no longer is a solution. Okay? That was the problem. But many of you will say, why is that a problem? Right? I mean, these coordinate conditions are gauge conditions. Why on earth should you insist that that condition that you just help yourself to, to convince yourself that the Newtonian limit is okay, why should you also use that in that context? So, you know, different problems, different coordinate conditions. Moreover, if you look in uh, 1915, you see that's no problem anymore. Einstein points out that, you know, these, the, 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 the half of the Ricci tensor, like, allows that rotation metric, then he imposes that same condition and doesn't say a word that there might be a problem there. So we still haven't quite got what the problem is. So, and the, the answer to that question is, and that took us a long time to figure out, that's in this Genesis volume, is that Pice was not entirely wrong. So Einstein did know these conditions, but he wasn't using these conditions the way we would now use a modern coordinate condition. And so instead of like this idea of using different conditions for different problems, he was using in a sort of a one-size-fits-all approach where these conditions actually become an integral part of the theory. And the, the field equation is not like the general covariant thing or the broadly covariant thing you start out with. It's the equation that is left after you've truncated it with this, the, with this condition. So to highlight this very idiosyncratic use of coordinate conditions, we call them coordinate restrictions. So the field equations for Einstein before November of 1915 is always like the idea is that there are some equations of broad covariance plus a coordinate restriction. And these coordinate restrictions have to do triple duty for Einstein. So first, you know, they have to ensure the Newtonian limit. But Einstein thought that they were also needed to guarantee energy momentum conservation. And moreover, you have to do one and two while maintaining enough covariance to do justice to the equivalence principle. That's a tall order. So Einstein went through many, many of these coordinate restrictions and found again and again that, you know, they just didn't work. Now, the problem is not quite as bad as you think, because you, would, you stare at this and you think, like, well, you know, this doesn't just rule out rotation. It rules out any nonlinear transformation. But there Einstein had a very clever idea, and that is, like, he uh, looked at coordinate transformations that are a little different from the modern ones. It's not just, you know, in, normally, like, if you do a coordinate transformation, the new coordinates are just functions of the old ones. That's what Einstein called autonomous transformation. He used what he called non-autonomous transformations, where the new coordinates are dependent on the old coordinates and the metric field in the old coordinates. Okay? Now, that looks like a very fancy idea, so let me just show you a concrete example to show you how clunky this really is. Remember, Einstein is new to this branch of mathematics. So look at this particular gadget, right? Write down the transformation law. If it were just this, this thing would transform just as you would like because of like the one free index here as a vector. But then you have all this other crap over here, okay? So what is the coordinate restriction? You just demand that this thing is going to vanish. That's the coordinate restriction, okay? And so this is just fancy language to like describe this rather primitive procedure. As I said, he couldn't find any, anything, even with that relaxation that worked. So he switched from math to physics. He constructed field equations for this new field in analogy with the only field theory that was available at the time, namely the Maxwell-Lorentz theory for the electromagnetic field in its special relativistic reformulation. And you make sure from the get-go that these equations do satisfy these physical requirements. They give the right Newtonian limit and uh, they satisfy energy momentum conservation. And the result was published in this paper by uh, Einstein for the physics, Grossman for the mathematics, outlined of a generalized theory of relativity and a theory of gravity. And the generalized here is, of course, indicating that you don't quite know how general this is. So the upshot then, to go back now to 1915, 
is that again, like this seems to sort of bear out what Einstein was saying, right? I, I lost confidence in this approach. I went back to this other one. I was already very close, right? I mean, in fact, like it's stronger than that. He had, ex he had examined the exact same field equations in the, in the Zurich notebook, right? And then there's all this stuff about really it's mathematics, mathematics, that's doing it. And there is a pair of like very amusing quotes to his close friend Besso that again seems to underscore this switch at the 11th hour from physics to mathematics that saved the day. And so right after it's over, he writes to Besso, he says, this time the obvious, the German is das nächstliegende, was correct. However, Grossman and I believed that the conservation laws would not be satisfied and that Newton's laws would not come out in first approximation. Okay? So read this quote, and it's clear that what he means by the obvious is the mathematics. Now look what he wrote like just a year earlier to Besser in March of 1914. He says, the general theory of invariance proof only proved to be an obstacle. The direct route proved to be the only feasible one. The only thing that I, is incomprehensible is that I had to feel my way around for so long before I found the obvious. The exact same word, das nächste liegen in German, and of course this time the obvious is the physics. Okay? So again, like, you know, it seems that I've been mounting this evidence for this picture that it is this switch at the 11th hour from physics to math that brought the breakthrough, right, and that Einstein was correct in his later years to put his faith in the mathematics because that was how he found like, general relativity. Right? But you're all waiting for the but, and it's coming now. If you look at the preponderance of the evidence, not just cherry-picking a few quotes, you see that, in fact, there is no such switch from math to physics. Einstein just doggedly followed the physical line of thought and was led back doing that to something that connected up very nicely with the mathematics. Now, to show you how confusing it is to just, like, you know, look at some of these quotes, like, here is Einstein talking to Besso again a little bit later in 1918, saying, like, Rereading your last letter, I find something that almost makes me angry. The speculation has proved itself to be superior to empiricism. You're thinking here about the development of relativity theory. I find that this development teaches something else, which is almost the opposite. Namely, that a theory to deserve our trust must be built upon generalizable facts. In the case of general relativity, a quality of inertia and gravitational mass. Never has a truly useful and profound theory really been found purely speculatively, okay? Which is the exact opposite of what he told his audience in Oxford. So this, remember what the old sage said, right? And now compare it to what the young Turk is saying to Besso. Now, in that uh, 1933 uh, speech, there are a few very interesting disclaimers, right? We already had the very sort of tepid one, like, well, yeah, of course, in the end, we need to check whether this works with the empirical data. There is, there is much more radical disclaimers. In the very first sentence of that speech, Einstein says this. If you want to find out anything from the theoretical physicist about the methods they use, I advise you to stick closely to one principle. Don't listen to their words, fix your attention on their deeds. <laughs> right? And then he proceeds to tell you how he did it. Right? And then a little later on, this is, the, uh, this is, I think, a very interesting comment. He says, the way in which a scientist working in some field, I paraphrase this, regards its past and present may depend too much on what he hopes for the future and aims at in the present. Okay. And so my, uh, my countryman, uh, Jeroen van Dong of the University of Amsterdam, has you know, like written this very nice book about Einstein's unified field theory, and his conclusion is that these pronouncements are just a way to advertise the unified field theory approach and are a very poor substitute for a history of how he found general relativity. Okay. So that then you know, brings us back to the question, how did Einstein find uh, uh, the field equations of general relativity? And this is what the five of us, uh, Tilman Zauer, John Norton, John Stachel, Jürgen Renn, and myself set out to do in this book, The Genesis of General Relativity. It took Einstein about like three years to do all this. It took the five of us ten years to reconstruct, you know, what was happening here. So, and I'm going to try and give you like sort of a, a concise version of like how this worked. So he's going to build this metric field theory in analogy with electromagnetic field theory. So you start with the field equations, right? And so you say, okay, it's the divergence of like the electromagnetic field tensor equal to the source, the charge current density. The gestalt here is like, you know, the same. You take the, uh, you take the divergence of, the of something uh, representing the gravitational field and you set it equal to the source, except that in this case, because of V equals mc squared, anything with energy is going to uh, generate the gravitational field. So you also have to represent 
the energy momentum of the gravitational field, right? Uh, what is now known as the energy momentum, the gravitational energy momentum pseudotensor. So the picture is this, right? For the four divergence of the field, you set that equal to the source. This is how Einstein operates. So now the thing is like, okay, what's then the relation between the field and the potential? The metric tensor is the, the gravitational potential. How do you get to a field? Well, again, you know, you look at electro electromagnetism, right? In a very simple case, well, if electrostatics, it's just the gradient of the electrostatic potential, but in general, it would be more complicated. And in a relativistic form, right, it's this combination of two terms with, like, derivatives of the, uh, uh, of the four vector potential. So, you know, what are you going to do here, right? So this is the Gestalt. So Einstein, like, in 1913, very sensibly takes as the gravitational field just the gradient of the metric. You know, forget about this piece. But as you see, like, you could have, like, a more complicated relation. And in 1915, he does something else. He, he picks these Christoffel symbols, which are a combination of, like, gradients of the metric, right? No different from what you have in the case of electromagnetism. There's one other, like, very striking parallel that Einstein only hits on in 1914, and that is when you put it in Lagrangian form. So the Lagrangian for the free Maxwell field is just this, and uh, the Lagrangian that Einstein uses is that, and the Gestalt, again, is just that the Lagrangian is something like the field squared. And if you stick that in, right, you get the vacuum field equations for uh, electromagnetism. If you stick it in here, lo and behold, you get exactly these end dwarf field equations. Okay? So... Einstein adopts this variational formalism to try and get a handle on the rather intractable covariance properties of these Entwerf field equations. And it's just the idea is it's simpler to check one component, the Lagrangian, than to check all these components of the field equations. And the other thing that energy momentum, that, I'm sorry, that the variational formalism does for him, it gives you a standard way of checking whether energy momentum uh, conservation is, is respected. So the results of Einstein's application to this is that, first of all, the one I already mentioned, right, that you get a very physically very plausible Lagrangian that has just exactly the same form as the one you find for the free Maxwell field. The other one that's much more interesting, he finds that the same condition that ensures that the field equations guarantee energy momentum conservation is also the condition that describes the range of covariance of these field equations under these non-autonomous transformations. So let me show you that in a little more detail. So starting with the Lagrangian for the gravitational part, he doesn't bother to write the matter part in Lagrangian form. You get the field equations, and then you see in order to, uh, in order to get the energy momentum conservation, right? I mean, it, it, it has to be the case that the, that the right-hand side here va vanishes. This is just like mathematically a rewriting of the covariant divergence of the matter energy momentum tensor vanishing. And you can see that you can impose that by just taking now this derivative on the left-hand side, and you get this condition that Einstein calls B sub mu. You set that equal to zero. If that condition is satisfied, in conjunction with the field equations, you now have energy momentum conservation. Okay? And what Einstein shows is that that condition doubles as the coordinate condition for the Entwerf field equations. And so now has this very interesting picture that you have these Entwerf field equations. Einstein is convinced that corresponding to that are some unknown generally covariant equations, but he doesn't in, he's not interested in those because like what you get is just what, you, what you're left with after imposing the coordinate restriction. Okay? All right. So uh, now in November of 1914, Einstein convinces himself that this whole approach uniquely fixes the Lagrangian for the Entwerf field theory. And in late June, early July, he gives the Wolfsky lectures in Göttingen, where there's one, a very attentive member in the audience, namely the guy over here, David Hilbert, who gets very intrigued by this theory. And unfortunately for Einstein, very shortly thereafter, he finds some devastating problems with this theory. So in September of 1915, he finds that that rotation metric that he had convinced himself was a solution of these equations is in fact not a solution of these equations. And that is a big problem because like that undermines the whole idea of the equivalence principle. So he starts looking some more and he finds that that uniqueness argument that he was so proud of in November of 1914 is just baloney. And that argument doesn't restrict the choice of Lagrangians at all, essentially. So he needs to find new field equations, and preferably before Hilbert beats him to the punch. So what is he going to do? So remember, the standard story is he scraps all of this and goes back to the mathematics. 
That's not what's happening. He has this whole, this whole system, and he's going to tweak just one component. He's going to change one element in the variational formulas, and namely redefine, redefine the gravitational field as, uh, as the Christoffel symbols. And, what he, and when he plugs that into this formalism, right, that comes out of this physical line of reasoning, he sees that it leads you right back to the stuff that is suggested by the Riemann tensor, namely half the Ricci tensor. So now he's real happy, right? These two lines of reasoning finally are converging. So now, what is our evidence, right? What is our evidence that this is what happened, right? So remember, these are the two choices. Our smoking guns are really two remarks Einstein makes. The first remark is, is, is in November 1915 paper, where he says, look, energy momentum conservation has led me in the past to look upon these quantities, the, the gradient of the metric, as the gravitational field, even though the formula, formulas of the absolute differential calculus, and one may add the geodesic equation, suggest that the Christoffel symbols should be that. And then he says, this was a fateful prejudice. These were ein verhängnisvolles Vorurteil. Okay? And then writing to Sommerfeld about these developments in November, like after the dust settles, he says, the key to the solution was that my realization that not this, but these other things are going to be the gravitational field. All right. So, all right. So now he has field equations that are covariant under unimodular transformations. Okay. And under such transformations, as I said, like the determinant of the metric transforms as a scalar. Um, now, this is it sort of brings like an unexpected windfall because remember the formalism gives you that condition b mu equals zero, that tells you what the extent of covariance is. It's some co covariance under non-autonomous transformations. And these, he now already knows from the connection to the math that the covariance is much broader than that. It's covariant under general unimodular transformations. So then the obvious, obvious question is like, well, maybe if because of this connection between covariance and conservation, maybe for conservation, I, doesn't, I don't need anything else either. Let's check that out. And so what he finds is that it's almost true. That energy momentum conservation only calls for one condition here. You can replace that b mu equals zero condition by just one condition, and that is that you should not set g equal to uh, minus one as long as t, the trace of the energy momentum tensor, is not equal to zero. Now, that's a bit of an odd condition, right? You have a theory that is covariant under unimodular transformations, but you cannot write that theory in unimodular coordinates. Okay? It's worse than that. Because like, it's very tempting to do this. Because if you do that, you can now look upon these field equations of the first November paper as generally covariant field equations in special coordinates. And let me just quickly remind you how that goes. Remember, the Ricci tensor is just the sum of these two parts. If g equals minus 1, s mu nu, right, which was constructed by starting from this vector, the, the, the derivative of the log of the square root of minus g, that's going to be zero. So all you're left with is this thing arm you knew, and you can say, look, we have generally covariant field equations now, and we've just written them in unimodal coordinates. So what you can see in Einstein's second and fourth November paper is like attempts to get around that annoying condition that you cannot set g equals to, uh, uh, to minus one. And so I should add that at the same time, like the perihelion calculations convince get Einstein over another hurdle that you may remember from last night. Einstein had this prejudice that the metric for a, for a weak uh, static field should be spatially flat. That means that there's only one variable component, namely the G00, G44, depending on how you label it. Clearly, as, as long as there's one, only one variable component, you cannot have that the determinant is going to be equal to one. Okay? So he gets rid of that prejudice in the course of the perihelion calculation. He realizes, oh, there can be all sorts of other components like that are not constants because those components do not enter into the equations of motion for Mercury. So what is he going to do? The second paper is very crude, right? This is what, you know, like the, you would, the first thing you would think, like, well, as long as t equals, well, set t equal to zero. Well, you cook up some argument for why that's reasonable. Well, matter is going to be all electromagnetism, like standard electromagnetism, that trace equals zero, even though we now probably have to go to something more general than Maxwell's equation. Let us assume that it remains zero, okay? He is not very happy. You can understand that he was not happy about this for very long. And in the fourth paper, he did something much more clever. He added a term with t to the right-hand side of the field equations. And if you do that, that whole, you can now pick for, uh, you can now set g equal to minus 1, regardless of the value of, the, uh, of that trace. So that's it. 
And then he also has like another argument that convinces him that this time he's got it and he doesn't have to come back another time to tweak these equations. Namely that on this model, you now have that the gravitational uh, energy momentum enters the field equations in the exact same way that the matter energy momentum uh, 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 enters the field equations. So, you know, we've got the arch now. Right? So let me, so, uh, so I, this is something that I'm pursuing more generally, that this idea that you get to a new theory by leveling the old one and building the new one on the burning embers of the previous theory of paradigm is wrong. I mean, in most cases what you see is that something is carefully built on top of something else and the discontinuity comes from looking at afterwards and see that a whole lot of previous stuff has been dropped out because it's been recognized as just scaffolding. So that's, I think, what's going on here. So in this case, like what, to be like less metaphorical, what is going on, he has this whole structure that is modeled on, on electromagnetism. Lots of relations and expressions. And in the course of this, he also has found this interesting connection between covariance and conservation, right, which later will become like a more general form, the Noether theorem. Um, and in this case, like he recognizes that the conservation is restricting the covariance. And that whole constellation survives intact. If you do one thing, you take the basic building block, the gravitational field out, a gradient of the metric, and you put a different gravitational field, Christoffel symbol, back in. And all these relations like uh, uh, survive. And you now see that you know, with this substitution, these Entwurf field equations of very limited and intractable covariance just turn into something that is directly a descendant of the Riemann curvature tensor, and you can now forget about a lot of the stuff that got you there. In particular, you can get rid of these stupid coordinate restrictions and these stupid non-autonomous coordinate trans transformations. That is just part of the scaffold. You know, you don't need to do that anymore. And Einstein also now has an interesting new take on the idea of this connection between covariance and uh, conservation. So before it was conservation restricts the covariance. Now it is covariance is actually guaranteeing the conservation, right? That's more in the spirit of the Noether theorem. So now the arch as it's unveiled in that first November paper still has clear traces of the scaffold. So, you know, uh, it's missing this keystone of the arch, namely that trace term. Um, and it's only like in November 1916 that Einstein finally bothers to write down how all of this works in general coordinates. Even in the review article of March 1916 that everybody reads, everything is still done in unimodular coordinates, just for convenience. Right. Now, so you know, there's still there's the embarrassing fact that Einstein had to come up, to come to his colleagues three times in three weeks, four weeks, with new field equations. So he writes to Sommerfeld again with his self-deprecating sense of humor. Unfortunately, I've immortalized my final errors in the Academy papers. And he writes to Ehrenfest, his close friend, a little bit later. He says, it's convenient with that fellow Einstein. Every year, he retracts what he wrote the year before. In this case, it's like closer to every week, he retracts what he wrote the week before. The other question that is left to answer here, and so in Einstein's defense, right, I mean, like, he needed to get there before Hilbert did. And so that then raises the question, like, did he? And so Hilbert presented his field equations in Göttingen on November 20th, 1915, five days before Einstein. Okay? He used the Riemann curvature uh, scalar as his Lagrangian. <coughs> now, he does, not, uh, uh, he does not evaluate the field equations, but I would stipulate that Hilbert would know, given any Lagrangian, how to figure out what the Euler Lagrange equations are. Okay? Those are the Einstein field equations. And so there's some confusion about like a piece that is cut out of, uh, of a document that bears on this, but I want to stipulate this much Hilbert had. Okay. Now in the late 90s, this is what I got a little ahead of myself, page proofs of this paper, which was not published until March 1916. Remember, this is the war, there's a paper shortage. Page proofs turned up, and lucky for us historians, the page proof carry a date stamp. And I'll blow it up for you. It's loud and clear, December 6th, 1915. What's in those page proofs? Okay. So the page proofs show that conceptually what Hilbert is doing in this, in this paper is much closer to what Einstein was doing conceptually to what he, what he was doing in the Entwurf theory than to Einstein's new theory. 
So yes, he has generally covariant equations, right? The Euler Lagrange equation for the Riemann curvature scalar. But just like Einstein before, he is now going to impose a coordinate restriction to essentially throw out the general covariance. And he calls this very tellingly, even though it's completely unclear what this condition has to do with energy momentum conservation, he calls this the energy theorem. I hope that you recognize how close this is to the way Einstein was thinking and what he presented in Göttingen just a few months earlier. What is the big change between the page proofs and the published paper? He just conveniently dropped that bit. Okay? So the moral then is that Einstein could have taken his sweet old time in November of 1915 and did not have to embarrass himself like, you know, publishing like, you know, results that were not quite right, right? Of course, it's a gold mine for, for us historians. We would never have been able to understand how he got there if we didn't have these wrong attempts first, right? He could have taken his time. And he had his little revenge on Hilbert, right? So the one paper that I haven't talked about, I don't have time to talk about it, is the third one on the perihelion motion. And uh, so, you know, that comes out like after one week of publishing the field equations. So Hilbert, and this is the quote you also heard last night, is just astounded. Boy, if I could calculate as fast as you can, you know, the, uh, uh, the, the electron would be forced to surrender to my equations and the hydrogen atom would have to bring a note from home to be excused for not radiating, <laughs> you know. Wow! Right? So, now, well, all that Einstein really had to do that one week is to tweak calculations that he had done at great length two years earlier with his friend Bessel, where he was calculating the perihelion motion of Mercury on the basis of these old field equations. Now, so it's, you know, you say have to change a few things, but you don't have to do this from scratch, okay? Einstein at the time did not know that the manuscript of those calculations would survive. It came to light like in the early 80s. And um, uh, so he conveniently neglected to mention to Hilbert that, well, you know, it's not quite as impressive as you think. And I think it fits very nicely with Einstein writing to Ehrenfest like a little bit later, where he characterizes the style of Hilbert as, quote, creating the impression of being Superman by obfuscating one's methods. <laughs> so at the end of the day, you know, Einstein could feel pretty good about himself in 1916, okay? Then he made one dreadful mistake. He went to the Netherlands. And there he met up with the Leiden astronomer, Willem de Sitter, who pointed out to him that, you know, this is all fine and dandy, but this theory of yours doesn't do what you set out to do, namely to eliminate the whole idea of absolute space. Because he pointed out, look, you know, you still have to just posit the boundary conditions on infinity and you bring absolute space right back in. So they're talking about this, and Einstein, of course, very quick on his feet. He proposes to the sitter, he says, okay, you know, let's imagine that the, on, on infinity, the boundary conditions, the metric is just completely degenerate. Okay? Those are generally covariant boundary conditions. Then assume that a little closer, right outside the visible universe, there are masses that somehow conspire to turn those boundary conditions into Minkowskian boundary conditions at the edge of the universe. All right. So you can guess what the sitter is thinking about this. He says, well, that's a cure worse than the disease. Okay. What is going to happen if our telescope gets a little better? The visible universe expands, right? So now you're going to have to push those masses out a little further, I guess. Right? Einstein never put this in print. We only know this because of, like, you know, the sitter telling us. So Einstein keeps thinking about this. It takes him a few months, and then he comes up with a really clever solution saying, look, if boundary conditions and infinity are the problem, just let's get rid of infinity. And so he writes to the sitter, like right before he publishes the paper, he says, I've completely abandoned my views, you know, about this, genera this degeneration. I'm curious to hear what you will have to say about the somewhat crazy idea I'm considering now. And the crazy idea is that the universe is spatially closed. So Einstein uh, comes up with, like, you know, the cylinder world, right? So simplify it, you have a one plus one dimensional uh, space-time embedded in a two plus one dimensional uh, Minkowski space-time. And the, the question now simply is like, is that a solution to the field equations? Okay. And he sticks it in and he finds, in fact, the answer is no. Well, not to worry, if we add like a term, the notorious, infamous cosmological term, then it is a solution. If a few conditions are met, namely that this constant lambda is equal to 1 over r squared, where r is the diameter of this uh, cylinder, 
and it's equal to the mass density. Right? So here you can also immediately see what this, uh, what this cosmological constant is doing. Right? There, there's always mass everywhere in this. Right? So the, the universe in this approximation is just one circle right? persisting through time. There's masses everywhere. That circle will just contract unless there's something pushing it out. That's what the cosmological constant is doing. All right. Now he has to sell this idea to the sinner. And how are you going to preempt the, the obvious criticism that the sitter is saying, look, you know, all right, so first it was these like invisible masses. Now you take this constant out of left field, all because of your philosophical hang up against absolute space. Okay? So he needs to come up with uh, like an argument, namely that, and the argument is going to be that even Newtonian cosmology is going to require a cosmological constant because otherwise you could not have like a static universe. Never mind that the sitter and others have already told him that there is no reason to suppose that the universe is static. Okay. So here is the paper he puts out. This paper, of course, becomes very famous. You know, it launches like uh, 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 relativistic cosmology. But in the end, it was a paper to settle this di dispute with the sitter. And you don't have to even have to be able to read German. You can just see it at the equation in the title. So he starts out with a Poisson equation, yada, 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 Newton's, Newton theory. And bang, there it is, like you add like a term. Yada, 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 you do the same thing for general relativity. Okay? And this now goes to the sitter. And here is my smoking gun that this really is what's behind that paper. It's not like what would be, would be a completely obvious kind of thing. Like, let's apply this new theory of gravity not to the solar system, but to the universe at large. That's not what's motivating Einstein. Einstein says to the sitter, from the standpoint of astronomy, I have, of course, just built a spacious castle in the air. It was a burning question for me, however, whether the relativity thought can be followed through to its conclusion or whether one runs into contradictions. Whether the model I constructed corresponds to reality is another matter. What is the sitter going to say? Okay. So here is his response. And here you, you get a sense of, like, you know, uh, this is going to be as hot as Dutch love. Well as long as you don't want to force your conception on reality, we're in agreement. <laughs> as a consistent train of thought, I have nothing against it and I admire it. I cannot give you my final approval before I have a chance to calculate with it. Okay? And so here's my moment of Dutch pride. Look at the date, March 15th. On March 20th, the sitter has done his calculations and he's found the sitter solution. And this, uh, these, these scribbles are basically the blueprint of the paper that he publishes in the Proceedings of the Amsterdam Academy. And what he does is like, okay, let's, we're, since we're playing around here, instead of this cylinder, let's look at this hyperboloid. And this is apparently suggested to him by Ehrenfest saying, look, a, a hyperboloid, the, the surface of a hyperboloid in Minkowski space-time, is just a direct analog of like a, a sphere in, in three-dimensional Euclidean space. Let's see whether that works. Okay, you stick the, the metric field describing this in the field equations with the cosmological term, and the answer is yes, it works as long as lambda is now 3 over r squared and the, the matter density equals zero. That's the bad news for Einstein. This world is empty, and the whole idea of lambda was that you could now forget about empty space and would always have matter, right? He wanted to get rid of these boundary conditions. So Einstein writes to the sitter, he says, it would be unsatisfactory, in my opinion, if a world without matter were possible. Rather, the G-mu-nu field should be determined by matter and not be able to exist without it. This is the core of what I mean by the requirement of the relativity of inertia, which Einstein renames mass principle in 1918. And this quote, you know, we know about it because like this was in the postscript of the paper that the sitter then publishes in the Amsterdam um, Academy. And since uh, Robert was the, was the director of this outfit, you know, before he uh, took over here, right, I thought I'd show you a little bit of the piece here. Na schrift, de heer Einstein, wien ik den inhoud van het bovenstaande in het kort had meegedeeld, schrijf mij, and then follows this. So a lengthy debate ensues now about whether this is a genuine counterexample or not. And people get very confused. I don't have time to go into this. But the hope of Einstein here is clear. He is hoping that this Mach principle will finally get him full relativity of motion because if you can reduce the metric field to its sources, 
You can now think about language that says it moves with respect to body B. I'm sorry, it moves with respect to space-time. You can see that as you know, sort of a shorthand for it moves with respect to body B producing this space-time. Right? So it's very important for Einstein that it's impossible to have space-times where there's no matter at all. And unfortunately, you know, like eventually in, in June of 1918, he has to concede that this is a genuine counterexample. And thereby he loses his enthusiasm for this whole approach and for Mach's principle and for the cosmological constant, even though you know that sort of still goes along, right? This quote about it being his biggest blunder is much later. And but he had by 1919 realized that in a way this whole principle has become sort of anachronistic, right? It was reasonable when you thought that matter was a bunch of billiard balls like interacting with each other and that you could reduce space time to the interaction between these, these billiard balls. But in the beginning of the 20th century, it's not about billiard balls anymore. It's the, the fundamental things are fields. And so I won't, use, I won't read you my quote here. This is what Einstein much later writes to the relativist Felix Perani. He says, in my view, one should no longer speak of mass principle at all. It dates back to the time in which one thought that the ponderable bodies are the only physical real entities and that all elements of the theory which are not completely determined by them should be avoided. And then he adds parenthetically, I'm well aware of the fact that I myself was long influenced by this idea fix. So Einstein comes up with a new project at this point, right? And this is where I'm going to end. So one way of looking at the special theory of relativity is that it unifies the electric and magnetic field into one electromagnetic field. Right? This is not done by Maxwell, not by Lorentz, this is done by Einstein. So general relativity is unifying inertia and gravity into what we now call the inertial gravitational field. So the obvious thing to do next then right, is a unified field theory in which you try to unify the electromagnetic field and the inertial gravitational field. Right? So, of course, I don't know what's in this box. So, again, if you want to find out, like, you know, what, what Einstein was, uh, how Einstein tried to do this, I recommend that you read Jeroen van Dongen's book. Thank you. <coughs>